great, Jared. You're now live on Facebook. Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, well, welcome. This is my first ever KHT online session. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Gerard Logan. I'm an actor and I am doing Wild Without the Boy at the uh, beautiful King's Head Theatre in Islington as part of Queer Season at the King's Head. Um, we opened last night to an absolute stonker of an audience. It was absolutely fantastic and I think that they, I think that they loved the show. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity, if I could, to um, tell you why I love the show so much, how it came about, and um, why I love Oscar Wilde so much, and why I will never, ever, ever get tired of playing him. Um, if you want to ask questions, that would be lovely. I will answer any questions that, that you want, and I, I think they'll come, come here on my feed. Um, I first did uh, one of Oscar Wilde's shows in, uh, in the 80s. That was A Woman of No Importance. And then later on, I did Lady Windermere's Fan. It was when I did Lady Windermere's Fan that I really started investigating Oscar Wilde. And I started reading some of his other works. And I came across uh, one of his works, De Profundis, which you'll probably know, is a letter that Oscar Wilde wrote to his lover, Lord Alfred Douglas, uh, whilst Oscar was in prison. Uh, Oscar had been sentenced to uh, two years hard labour for, in quotes, acts of gross indecency. Essentially, the man was was gay, and um, but that's how it was regarded at, at that time. And two years hard labour, they knew it would kill him. They knew it would kill him. And really, it all came about because um, Oscar Wilde was in a relationship with Lord Alfred Douglas, as I said, and Lord Alfred Douglas's father was a man called the Marquis of Queensbury, who you probably know is... Um, most famous for inventing the rules of boxing. And Marcus Queensbury was absolutely appalled that his son was in this relationship with Oscar Wilde. He was a kind of vicious, vindictive man, the Marcus of Queensbury. And he started slandering Oscar Wilde. Uh, he left him a note uh, at his uh, club, the Albemarle Club, saying to uh, Mr. Oscar Wilde, posing as a sodomite, although he was very clever and he wrote it posing as a somdomite. So I guess that he felt that was terribly clever so that if Oscar Wilde said that he called him a sodomite he said no I didn't I called him a somdomite and very very much under uh, Bosey's uh, Alfred that was what Al Alfred Douglas was called Bosey um, uh, encouragement um, he took um, the Marcus of Queensbury to court for defamation of character and so Oscar Wilde initiated these legal proceedings and it was all going terribly well in court Oscar Wilde was being um, uh, the prosecuting barrister was actually somebody with whom Oscar Wilde had been at university in, in Dublin. And Oscar Wilde was playing with him like a cat with a mouse, you know. And uh, it was all going terribly well, and Oscar Wilde was making the, 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 the court laugh, you know, until finally um, uh, Carson said to him uh, about one of these rent boys whom um, the Marcus of Queensbury produced, giving evidence against Oscar Wilde, uh, he said, uh, did you ever kiss him? And Oscar Wilde gave this answer, which was, oh, no, he was peculiarly ugly. Um, and Carson said, what? Is that why you didn't kiss him? And Oscar Wilde was, 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 was put off guard and he said, I, I was stunned by the, by the impertinence of your question. Um, anyway, essentially, that was it, frankly. And but Wilde's barrister insisted that he um, dropped the case and then Queensbury came after Wilde. Now, Wilde could have left the country, but he didn't. I've actually sat in the hotel room at the Cadogan Hotel where he stayed, where he was waiting for the, pl to, the police to arrive to come and arrest him. I've waited in that room. I've sat in that room. Uh, the long and the short of it was that Oscar Wilde was sentenced to two years hard labour, which they, as I said, they knew would kill him. This is the breaking of stones, it's the sewing of sacks, it's the scrubbing of already very shiny floors. It is designed to break you, and they knew it would break Oscar Wilde. Um, towards the end of his sentence, he wrote Lord Alfred Douglas this letter, because Lord Alfred Douglas, to be honest, was not a very pleasant piece of work. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that. One has to be very careful, but I think it would be fair to say that. And Oscar Wilde wrote in this letter, which he entitled De Profundis, which was really all about um, trying to show Bosey uh, uh, how he had ruined his life and, uh, and how he um, 
he wanted to show Bosey that that um, he was he wanted he was writing this letter to, to help to, to confront Bosey with his own with Bosey's vanity and how that vanity had destroyed him, destroyed Oscar. And it is a very searing letter. It's a very passionate letter. It's a very bitter letter. And this is what Wild Without the Boy, that letter is what Wild Without the Boy is based on. And I just read this letter when I did Lady Windermere's Fan and it completely blew me away. It is a work of art. And um, it is a work of art and it is one of the most brilliant pieces of writing I have ever, I have ever, ever read. And it was really that, reading that, it really inspired me uh, to do a solo show about it. And my brilliant director, uh, Gareth Armstrong and myself, we, we, we got together and then Gareth did a, a dramatization of the letter and we got to it. We'd already done Rape of Lucrece and had success with that. And really that's how Wild Without the Boy came about. And I just love doing it. I love Oscar Wilde. I love that man. I love him because he managed to, all of the persecution and the pain which was visited upon him, because he went from being hailed as the greatest writer, the greatest literary genius of his age. He went from that to being a complete social pariah, every kind of pariah you can think of, um, destitute, penniless, completely, completely outcast and reviled. No one wanted anything to do with him. And, but he went from, so, so he went to being this pariah, but, but rather than become bitter, he became, he turned around and he faced all of this bitterness, all of this persecution, all of this ugliness, or as Oscar would have put it, not ugliness. I don't even think he liked using the word. He would call it un, unbeauty or unbeautifulness. Um, and he turned around and he embraced it. Not only that, he made spiritual gold out of it. Um, I've heard of, weaving straw into gold by that special kind of alchemy. But Oscar turned around and he metabolized all of this pain, all of this persecution, all of this sorrow into beauty. And I would suggest became a, an even greater Oscar Wilde post his prison sentence than he was before it. He wrote The Ballad of Reading Jail which I normally do in tandem with Well Without the Boy. Um, and it was published some six months after Oscar left prison. And it wasn't published under his name. It was published under his prison number, C33, because no one would publish any work by Oscar Wilde. And people found him that disgusting and that revolting. Um, and so that's really where we are. And we opened last night at the King's Head. I've played it all over the UK. Um, uh, it's, it, it's an award-winning show. I hope it doesn't sound horribly big-headed saying that. But it's an award-winning show. And we opened last night at the King's Head, which is a theatre I absolutely love. And I think it's fair to say that the audience really did love it. And I'm under no illusions that they loved it because of me. They loved it because of Oscar. They loved it because of the size of the man's heart. I'd have loved to have met him. He's had the most incredible impact on me. I've met him a little bit through doing Wild Without the Boy. And I can sort of feel his, yes, I hope I don't sound horribly pretentious here, but I can sort of feel his presence during the show. And I do meet him. And his heart and his genius never ceases to amaze me. I hope I've become a better person through meeting and, and knowing Oscar Wilde a little bit. And I would really love it if you came to the King's Head and you met him too. I think I can guarantee that having spent an hour in his company, and that's just the show just lasts an hour, having spent an hour in his company, I think I can guarantee that you will leave the theatre walking on air because I think that's the impact that Oscar had on everyone. So that's a little bit about how the show came about. 
Um, I'll wait for your questions if you want to ask any questions. Um, until then, I shall just carry on talking. Um, yeah, we, 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 Gareth has done the most incredible dramatization of De Profundis, uh, which means from the depths. Um, so from the depths of his soul, but also I would imagine it means from the deepest dungeon as well, which is where he was. And I, just, I, I would so love to have met him. I look at pictures of him and I just... Also, the thing that I find wonderful about Oscar Wilde is that he, apparently he was not like those people, the other, these other incredible intellects that you meet. He did not bully. He did not commandeer conversations. He would give the floor to you. He was incredibly generous of spirit and warm hearted. That uh, generosity of spirit was part of his undoing because the male prostitutes with whom he was involved, he would give them presents and he would give them lighters inscribed to Alfred uh, or Charles, Charles Parker, Alfred Wood. And he would say to Alfred or to Charles um, um, from, um, from Oscar, and these were produced against him at, uh, at, the, at the trial. I've got a lovely question here from Ruth, who says, what is your favorite wild play? My favorite wild play. Um, I always feel that people want, uh, are expecting me to say the importance of being earnest, but it's not. It's not just my favorite wild play. It's my favorite play, which is Lady Windermere's Fan. That's how I really became completely spellbound by Oscar Wilde. It is, I played Darlington in, in Lady Windermere's Fan. And it, it was just so beautifully romantic. And I, you know, genuinely, I, I'm not a drinker. I don't drink. I haven't had a drink in a very, very long time. Don't drink at all. But it, it's absolutely true to say, I came off stage every single night feeling as if I had, my flowing through my veins was the most celestial champagne. I'd be walking on air. It lifted my spirit. And it was one of those really special experiences in my life that I, I will never forget, it was, it was actually completely seminal on me, had the most incredible impact on my soul. Um, Gareth Armstrong, my director, um, he was there last night. He's just completely insurpassable. There's no one like him. He is brilliant, loving, sensitive, and what he was constantly trying to hammer home to me in rehearsal was that what we want here with Wild Without the Boy is we want the audience to feel that they've spent an hour in the man's company. We want the audience to understand in, in the, through your playing of the piece, we want the audience to understand and feel and, and, and know how it could be that he was able to kind of walk in a room and everyone was drawn towards him like a, 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 a magnet. Um, I've got a lovely question here from Glenn. Uh, 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 um, Glenn says, uh, do, do I have any plans to push this into a one-off television production to maybe hopefully reach a bigger audience for both yourself and the piece? Well, that would be lovely. That would be lovely. Um, I don't harbor any great ambitions for that. I, I, do you know, the truth is, I would be, uh, I mean, that would be lovely. I would insist on Gareth directing it. I would not, I would definitely not want anyone else directing it. Gareth could direct it. And I, it would be lovely, um, but I harbor no great ambitions for that. I, I, do you know, the truth is, rather like when I was doing Rape of Lucrece, and I, I still do Rape of Lucrece, uh, the other, the other, uh, one of the other solo shows I do. Um, I would be happy. I would be really happy uh, if I was doing well without the boy to one person in a cellar for the rest of my life. If I did nothing else, I would feel so blessed 
and so grateful and enriched. And I would, to, to just to go on stage and get to say those beautiful words and get paid for it. Um, the, the, the payment is really kind of irrelevant, but just to go on stage and say these beautiful words is a privilege. So Glenn and uh, Glenn and Ruth, thank you so much for your lovely questions. And um, I shall look forward to more. Um, I just would love you to come to the show and, and share in Oscar. Um, he, he, as he would say, he would look forward to the grace of your sweet companionship. And I think that he would, he would, he would make you feel like you were the most important person in the room. I think probably to him, you would be the most important person in the room. He combined this knowledge of his own brilliance and his own genius, it was a fact, with a, a completely relentless appreciation of the beauty and the elegance of other human beings. Obviously, he was an aesthete, um, somebody who was committed to the appreciation of beauty in whatever he saw. It's very true. There's a, there's a bit in the play where Oscar describes being on Clapham Junction Station after he was sentenced. He was transferred from Pentonville Prison to Reading Prison. And he was on Clapham Junction Station and he was handcuffed and in prison dress, simply there for the world to look at. And there was a riot around him. And he said that people started to laugh at the sight of him. He said, of all possible objects, I was the most grotesque. When people saw me, they laughed. That was, of course, before they knew who I was. As soon as they had been informed, they laughed still more. Oh my goodness. A bit like, almost like the elephant man or something. Um, but even there he refused, refused to be angry with them. Got another question here from Ruth. Um, Oh, a lovely, a lovely um, uh, message here from Ruth in Belfast. Hello, Ruth. Hello. Um, um, I love doing, uh, yes, I did uh, Wild Without the Boy in Belfast. Um, that was lovely. And thank you again for your, for your question, uh, Ruth. She, Ruth says here, after seeing Wild Without the Boy, um, you do feel as if it was Oscar on stage, which I am, which blows me away. I should be so lucky. I, I, I should be so lucky to be able to get up there with that degree of intellectual brilliance and lovingness of heart. I should be so lucky. I feel so privileged and so grateful that you say that, Ruth. Thank you. Um, after seeing Wild, Wild Without the Boy on stage, you do feel as if it was Oscar on stage. Thank you. Um, and Ruth says, I hope you bring it back to Belfast soon. I hope so too, uh, Ruth. I really, really do. Um, Oscar said, you know, I, um, I am not English. Well, actually, I'm Irish. Gerard, I'm, I'm Irish. Uh, my parents are Irish. But Oscar said, I am not English. I am Irish, with his, which is something quite different. But he didn't, I think when he came over to England, he, he did his best to submerge. Well, he, not he did his best, he did. He submerged his Irish accent and spoke very much as I speak now. It's a deliberate act. You know, words to Oscar are some, they are solid, they are, um, how can I put this? They are substantial objects. Each word is a, an individual parcel of impact and beauty. And rather like the Shakespeare, what, what you've got to do is if you can, and one tries, my whole life is committed to doing this, is to try to respect the sounds within the words in order to release that beauty, that power, that impact. And I, I just think that that is why probably I, I, I do try and do that. And that is why I always feel that The words work their magic on me, you know. They work. They work their magic on me, and I maybe that's why I feel as if I've always come across, come come off stage, 
if I don't feel I've done a good stage, I feel I've let, let Oscar down. I feel I've let, let Oscar down. If I come off stage thinking that I've done an okay show, I, I can never really hope to do any more than an okay show because I could, as I say, I could never really hope to uh, get up there with that degree of brilliance, which is him. It's just I've just got to make it my life's aim to do to do that. Um, you do feel I, I I I do I feel it's fun coming off with champagne running through my veins. That's Oscar. That's his soul. That's his soul. Come on, I want more questions. Where are your questions? I want more. I've had one from Ruth, I've had one from Glenn, both of them beautiful questions. And I want more, please. That would be really, really lovely. What else can I say about Oscar? Um, just he was an appreciator of beauty. What a wonderful way to live your life. To be a, an, an appreciator of beauty. To have no truck with bitterness, to have no truck with any sort of ugliness, but always to try and see the beauty in everyone and everything. I think in many ways that's Oscar's biggest impact on me. I do try to live my life that way. I do try to, if I, if a side of myself emerges, which I don't like, I do try to imagine what Oscar would have done, how he would have coped. And I think what he would have done was he would have recognized it, but he would have recognized it as weeds in the garden of his soul. And he would have gone out there and he would have ripped them up, but not thrown them away. I think he would have looked at them and go, right, okay, what, what is the beauty here? And I think he would have seen that they weren't actually weeds, it was just his mindset that was seeing them as weeds. What he had here was a different kind of flower, a different kind of beauty, of which he had not yet accepted the beauty uh, or, 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 or uh, appreciated the beauty. And he would have turned around and he would have metabolized those into beauty, beauty of the soul. Um, I want more questions. Where are your questions? Give me more questions. I should just carry on talking about Oscar. I'm delighted. I mean, if you give me a chance to talk about Oscar, I would be, I, I would be delighted. Um, what are my hopes for the show? My hopes are to do it greater and greater justice. There was not an ounce of self-pity in that man, not an ounce. Um, I think, you know, he had the option of, uh, 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 I've got a question here from Glenn. What do you find most challenging about rehearsing and or performing in a one-person show? Well, I mean, I, it was never an ambition of mine, Glenn, you know, to do a, a one-person show. I love other actors and I like working with other actors, you know. Um, I, 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 I really do. What I find most challenging is you you if you're doing a solo show if i was going to be really really blunt it's easy to become a legend in your own mirror you know it's easy to just go off into your own orbit you know and you, you've got to be very very cruel to yourself you don't have another wonderful actor there or uh, you know i don't have kenneth branner on the stage with me and we come off and he says to me what were you doing? I don't. So I'm very lucky. I've got an amazing director who will do that, but quite frequently he's not in. So I'm always very, very fearful about saying that show went well, that show went well. No, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it went well. And if it did go well, it can always go better. You know, you've got to be, you've got to be cruel. You, you've got to approach it with great humility and, and just go, look, I will never get this right. Never, ever, ever. Like with Rape of Lucrece, you'll never get that, never get that right. Shakespeare's too brilliant for me. I just have to try and get up there. And if I come off stage thinking, yeah, got it there. Did a really, really good show. No, no. I'm on the wrong track as soon as I start thinking like that. 
if I come off stage, <laughs> I'm tempted to say, if I come off stage hating everything I've done, that's, I'm on the right track. I'm on the right track. Um, but I just wanted to say, oh, oh, um, a legend in your own mirror. Yeah, Glenn, yes. Well, that's true, Glenn. What else can I say? That is the absolute truth. Um, uh, um, you've only got you. You've only got this. You, you, it, it, it is completely ruinous to the show and completely unconducive, inconducive to doing Oscar justice, to be self-congratulatory. And I refuse. It simply, no, mustn't happen. So yes, a legend in my own mirror. Yeah, that is what my life is devoted to not becoming. Sorry, I split an infinitive there, to not becoming. Not becoming that. But I just wanted also to say that this show is part of queer season at the King's Head Theatre. I've often wanted, you know, Oscar did have the option to flee abroad. When he knew that Queensbury was coming after him, he did have the option to flee abroad. And many of his friends encouraged him to. But he didn't. And I really wonder whether Oscar Wilde's stature would be as great. Now, it seems to get greater and greater today if he had a fled abroad. There is definitely some, something about him of an embracing of his fate. He turned around and faced and confronted what was coming at him. And I, I really wonder, uh, 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 in so doing, I don't know if he was thinking like this, I doubt if he was thinking like this, but I think he knew that he was committing himself to a greater cause. And turning around and confronting ugliness with beauty and elegance and humility and a refusal to get down in the gutter with that ugliness, but to deal with that with elegance. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Well, Oscar was definitely looking at the stars. He refused to look at anything else. He refused hate, entry into his heart. And I think for the gay community, the service that Oscar did to gay people, I, I don't just mean for gay people, I mean, I'm not gay myself, but for people facing any kind of massive trauma in their lives, any kind of prejudice, racism, sexism, homophobia, to turn around and face that ugliness and confront it with elegance and beauty and genius and wit and charm. Yeah, it might seem as if ugliness gets the upper hand in the short term. <sighs> But I think the long term bears out that, you know, ugly, ugliness won the battle. He got two years hard labor. But love and elegance wins the war. That war is never ending. It's still winning the war now. Glenn, um, thank you, Glenn. You, uh, Glenn says, you are an inspiration, Gerald. Your passion and enthusiasm for both the work and the industry is infectious. The King's Head are very lucky to have you as part of their queer season. How many shows are you doing? How long is your run there? Thank you very, very much, Glenn. Well, uh, we opened last night and we've got four more shows. Yes. Give me a chance to play Oscar and I'm a happy man. Um, four more shows and I want as many people there as possible. Not for me, but for Oscar and for the King's Head. 
because theatres have had the most terrible time over the last year. And the King's Head is a theatre like few others. I've, I've, I love that theatre. I love it so, so much. It's given me, I've worked there a couple of times before, and it's given me some of the greatest moments of my life, the King's Head. It is a theatre like few others. And, you know, just being there last night, it was actually, I think last night was a, a real, a real, a really special night. Anyway, to answer your question, Glenn, just say we are on until Saturday. So it's tonight, Friday, tomorrow, and then two on Saturday, one at 5 p.m. and one at 9 p.m. on Saturday. And I would just love it if you came. Let's pack out every single performance for Oscar and for the King's Head and for theatre. Let's do it. Let's pack it out. Let's react as Oscar would to COVID as Oscar would have reacted to it. Now we can get out, we can take care, we can be socially distanced, we can take precautions, but we can go out now and thrust beauty out into the world as a reaction to COVID and fill the beautiful King's Head up with even more beauty every single performance. Let's do it. I just want to say, because I think I'm coming towards the end of this now, which is sad. I could go on forever. Um, but I just want to say thank you so, so much for your company. I do hope that you're able to get to the show. I'd love it if you did. Oscar would love it if you did. I always imagine he's there during the shows. I do. I always do. For myself, I always imagine him keeping a very sharp eye on me, making sure that I'm doing him justice. And... Um, come along and be part of the brilliant queer season at the king's head so i hope that you'll come any other questions we've got time for one more i think any other questions we've had questions from ruth we've had questions from glenn which or both of which are fantastic any other questions at all we are all in the gutter but some of us are looking at the stars what a way to live your life I think I've got, I think, I think, I won't speak for anybody else, but I know that in, inside me, I've got my own personal gutter. Inside me is all, all sorts of blackness, you know? But Oscar has taught me not to live in that, always to look for the beauty. That's what I want. That's how I want to live my life. Um, and Ruth says, I think Oscar would be proud of you. Thank you so much. Well, Ruth, I hope so. What can I say? I hope so. Um, I am really, really so thrilled and so delighted to have your company. And um, I don't know how much longer we've got left, but I'm happy to carry on talking. I think I'll be be um, uh, be, be, be be cut off when uh, when when the King's Head think it's right. Um, so yes, we uh, carry on tonight. We've got a show tonight at nine p.m. Another one tomorrow night at nine p.m. One on Saturday at five p.m and another one on Saturday at 9 p.m. And yes, let's pack out every single show. Let's, let's pack it out. I'm just trying to think of if there's anything else. To, 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 to return to Glenn's question you know, earlier on about, about any uh, aim to do it on TV or anything like that. I mean, it would be lovely, it would be lovely, but I don't have any great ambitions to, I don't. I, I, I have performed this show up in Edinburgh, for instance. I remember when I first opened up in Edinburgh, it was, there were very few people in. But it wouldn't have mattered to Oscar. So it doesn't matter to me. There's a lovely, a lovely story that I heard. You know, when Oscar was in Paris, after he was in disgrace and ruined, he would sit outside a cafe. People would pass, uh, usually English people. And he would stop them. They'd say, you're Oscar Wilde. He said, yes, join me, you know, join me at my, my table. And they would sit down and they would have lunch and they would have lovely wine and they would, and he would regale them and he would speak to them. And of course, conversation with Oscar Wilde, I mean, what a privilege. And then about four hours later, he would get up and say, well, it's been a very lo lovely experience meeting you. Thank you so much. And I wish you well. Of course, that was his um, thing. He would go away and leave them with the bill. He couldn't possibly pay it. 
he was penniless. There's a really horrible story I heard one time about when the, uh, an opera singer was in Paris and she saw him coming around a corner. This man, sort of like a big loose, dirty suit on him and red face, puffy, you know, overweight. And he was, <laughs> and he went up, I can't remember her name, but he went up to her and he said, hello, madam. You won't know me, remember, my name is Oscar Wilde and they need to do something quite dreadful. I'm going to ask you for money. And she gave him all the money that she had. And he went, he didn't even say thank you. It was almost as if he knew. He was too ashamed to say thank you. <sighs> Dear, I don't know. It's a tragic story. A tragic story. There's, there's something Christ-like about Oscar. And there's something, definitely something about him that he, he knew that, that, I think there was something he knew he was, what he was doing, he was doing for gay people. He knew that there was nothing wrong whatsoever with being gay. He knew and and I, I, I do think there was a part of him that knew that he, he was kind of sacrificing himself, sacrificing his future, embracing a tragedy. He was tapping the future and knowing that it would be conducive to love for gay people in the future. That might sound terribly romantic, but I don't care. He's certainly brilliant enough to have touched the future in that way. Um, and I just keep going, you know, I would have loved to have met him. Every now and again, I have dreams about him. Dreams about sort of shaking his hand, you know, and sitting down with him and talking. And I think coming to the show, I think, again, not because I'm so brilliant, but because of De Profundis is so brilliant, on which Wild Without the Boy is based, you will meet him and you'll meet a very different side to him. A lot of times people come to the show and they think, oh my goodness, oh, you know, I can't wait for an hour of witticisms and um, Wildian epigrams scattered around the theatre like diamonds, you know. Yes, that's there, but he, you won't get that. What you will get is a letter written to Lord Alfred Douglas. And what this letter is about, it's about trying to show Lord Alfred Douglas, Bosey, who, as I said, first of all, he, I think, and thank you, Glenn. Glenn says, broken legs and best wishes for the rest of your run. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. It really means the world to me. Uh, and thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much. So, and, uh, and best wishes back to Belfast as well. So I think probably we're coming to the end of our time here, maybe. Um, so I shall, I shall say goodbye then. All right, take care and thank you so much for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>